It's a little shallow. Let's try that. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. There you go. Uh, welcome to the 40th National Direct Instruction Conference. Uh, it's great, great pleasure for me to be here today. Um, I thank you all so much for taking time out of your summer to come to uh, the warm Northwest. Uh, we we always order in special weather for the for the Eugene Conference, and um, the weatherman has not let us down again. Uh, we should have a great time at the picnic this evening. Hopefully, we won't uh, sweat too much into our burgers. At any rate. Um, this, uh, this 40th year, while uh, would in some senses uh, um, sort of mark a landmark in terms of continuity, but it also is a landmark in terms of a little bit of a change. The organization that formerly uh, had sponsored this conference for about uh, 30 plus years uh, is no longer in existence. Uh, the Association for Direct Instruction, unfortunately, uh, underwent a demise last October. But uh, fortunately, another organization, us, the National Institute for Direct Instruction, was ready to continue on and carry on the standard of high quality training that you all have come to expect. As a matter of fact, how many of you have been to the National DI Conference before? That's fantastic. It looks like about half of you, and that's, I really appreciate you sticking with it and uh, uh, your dedication to quality education for our kids. And the rest of you, welcome. Again, welcome. That's we're a very welcoming organization. <laughs> that was, I appreciate the chuckles. I didn't think that was going to be a joke, but I appreciate the chuckles. <laughs> Uh, at any rate, um, yes, it's great to have you all here. I want to uh, tell you a little bit about NIFTI, the National Institute for Direct Instruction. We were founded uh, initially to show what a full immersion implementation of direct instruction could look like in schools, how to create, help schools, partner with them, and create truly excellent schools. We have a 20 plus year history of doing that and would welcome the opportunity to talk to any of you who are interested in partnering with us in the implementation side of things. We also sell a few materials related to direct instruction. We make a lot of the materials that we use in our own implementations available to you know, the general public Public. They're, uh, they're very useful tools, and in our store that we have out there, um, several, uh, several of those tools are, are out there for you to look at and, uh, and purchase, take with you, or just peruse. Uh, the, another area that NIFTI is involved in is we have what are now, we call them uh, open enrollment uh, uh, trainings. These, are, these take the form of our conferences and institutes such as this. And then we also run shorter two-day academies around the country. Notably, we have a leadership academy that we run. We'll be having some in October in Orlando as well as in Houston. And we have a, a, a series of coaching uh, academies that we offer throughout the school year. And so stay tuned for information on that. Best way to stay tuned for information on that is by becoming a member of the National Institute for Direct Instruction. What that membership does is it gets you access to some of our website uh, content on, a, on an advanced basis. It also gets you a 20% discount on our trainings, as well as 20% off any of the materials that you may purchase. It does not get you 20% off implementation packages, I'm sorry to say. But you'll also have the knowledge that you're doing an excellent, uh, that what you're doing is helping support our organization in going out and uh, doing good things in schools. If you sign up for a, as a member while you're here at, the tr at this conference, you will not only get the badge that you have that says attendee, but to clip onto the bottom of it, you'll get one that says member. And think how proud you're gonna be walking through the hallway with that badge that says member. It's a mere $50 a year. You attend one of our trainings, it's gonna more than recoup the cost of that. So please consider joining, uh, joining up with us and becoming a member of the National Institute for DI. We have, uh, a great schedule lined up for the conference. 
Uh, you all, on your yellow sheet that you received upon registration, it does detail the various times that our sessions are taking place, a few special events, including uh, the picnic this evening. And I really want to point out the, uh, the social hour, the McGraw-Hill uh, sponsored social hour and celebration of excellence. It's going to be taking place Wednesday evening at six o'clock. It'll be in this room or these rooms. And uh, along with uh, our generous friends from McGraw-Hill sponsoring and giving us some fine uh, heavy, heavy hors d'oeuvres, uh, some beverages. Um, we will also be uh, giving out uh, the Siegfried Engelman Excellence in Education Award to a teacher out of Utah. And uh, while you know, that may not sound like it's terribly exciting, I gotta tell you, each year that this event is held, I uh, do not regret for a moment attending. Uh, the stories that people have to tell and when you hear about the passion for doing a good job in the classrooms and in our, for our kids, uh, it's really a compelling, a compelling evening. Um, so let me do one little thing that I just sort of neglected to do, getting all excited about doing this. And to give a very special welcome, I'd like to bring up the mayor of the city of Eugene, Kitty Piercy. Um, she has a few special words that she would like to pass along to you, so thanks. So one of the pleasures I get being Mayor of Eugene is to welcome people, so welcome. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to say uh, that uh, you're here in, in, in our summer when it abounds with track and field events, the Bach Festival, summer in the city, all kinds of fun things to do. We, there's good food and good shopping and wonderful riverfront walking and biking. So we hope you enjoy your stay in the community. And I also want to say in spite of the trepidations about warm weather tonight, one of the assets that we usually have in Eugene is when it gets warm, you still get those nice breezes that kind of make it a, a, a lovely place to be even when it's warm. So we'll hope that holds for you tonight. As a former teacher, I learned about direct instruction way back in the 70s from my husband who was head of special education for 4 J School District, and I use these skills in my own classrooms because I'm a former teacher. As mayor, I take, yeah. <clears throat> As mayor, I take pride in the many ways that Eugene has contributed to the field of education over the years through the University of Oregon, Lane Community College, and our pre-K elementary high school programs, and in direct instruction. In Oregon, our education system, like probably many of you, has faced many challenges in recent years, primarily in terms of the effect of inadequate funding and consequent loss of important classroom options and increased requirements. Still, we see many research-based education entrepreneurial innovations coming out of the university and into the job market. This is good for education and good for our city. Eugene is a city that knows our success all of us, depends on the success of our children, being well educated and prepared for the future. So I hope you have a very successful conference, continue to learn and share, and to, and to contribute to the future of children everywhere. And I sincerely, sincerely thank you for your work. Have a great day. Thank you for that. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to come see us. So where was I? Oh, yes. Um, we've got some exhibitors out in the hall. There's a uh, Rocket Math is out uh, showing some of their material. We've got McGraw Hill has a very extensive booth. You'll be able to see a um, number of their, or all of the direct instruction product line. You'll be able to recognize the McGraw Hill representatives. They're either wearing red, black, or white and most of them have a name tag that identifies them as being with McGraw-Hill, and they'd be happy to talk to you about the different products that they have. So, a bit about the conference. This conference, for those of you, half of you who've attended before, you've heard this before, uh, it is a training conference. This is not a paper grab. This is not where you're gonna find benefit from hopping from session to session to session. They are continuous training, so please do us the favor of sticking with the session that you signed up for. If it's not appropriate in terms of its content, you probably ought to know within the first 10 minutes, 15 minutes or so. If that is the case, please leave the material behind in the session and come out and see us and we'll help 
place you into a more appropriate session so you have a great conference experience. Um, we could flog that one for a long time, but Ziggy's getting very anxious to get up here and talk, so I'll, I'll ease off on that for a moment, although we do have people watching, just to let you know. At NIFTY, uh, I am privileged to work with some fantastic people, uh, and a lot of them are here today. Rochelle Davison, who's our director of training, uh, is putting an awful lot of work on this conference. Uh, Tamara Bressi, who is our training development uh, coordinator, uh, does a fantastic job of doing just that. Uh, I work with uh, next door to somebody who makes it a lot of fun to come into work every day, Christina Cox, she's our marketing and publicity director, and uh, Carrie Beck is our national implementation coordinator. I guess anybody who I said was a director is actually a coordinator, I'm sorry. I'm new with the company, I've only been here a year, so it just takes a while. Um, our trainers here at this conference, some of them work for Nifty on a, on a regular basis, some of them are independent contractors that we have worked with uh, that we have coming in because of the excellence that they've demonstrated. These are people who are uh, who have come up through the ranks, many of them starting out as, as classroom teachers, supervisors, uh, and, and on through, excellent coaches, consultants, working in hundreds of buildings, impacting the lives of literally tens of thousands of children. You're never gonna find a greater group of trainers than you'll find uh, assembled here in Eugene, Oregon. So I'd like them, if they're in the room, there are trainers to stand. I'm not gonna read you off name by name, but these are the folks who recognize them with their. You'll find all of these individuals, they are wearing blue name tags. You'll find them to be very approachable. So if during uh, break times or lunch or whatever, uh, you, you just want to stop and chat with them, you'll find that they're, they're, just, they're, they're great, genuine people and uh, they are pleased to be a part of this also. Oh, I realized when I did the introductions of the staff that I forgot one person, and that is uh, a guy who I really appreciate the confidence and trust he put into me a couple of years ago, bringing me on board at Nifty, and that would be the president of the organization, Kurt Engelman. Kurt, I would uh, like to invite you to come up now and uh, introduce our keynote speaker, but this is Kurt Engelman. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Love the tie. So Eugene, isn't it? <laughs> well, half of you have been here before, so half of you have heard our first keynote speaker, who is my father, as well as the professor, professor of education at the University of Oregon, creator of direct instruction, founder of NIFD, the National Institute for Direct Instruction, and the senior author of the DI programs, Zig Engelman. Seek for yes, you get a hand. He has authored over a hundred different programs that employ the DI method, ranging from beginning reading to algebra. And he keeps on producing new programs. Right now, he and his colleagues are working on a revision of the Horizons reading program so that it has a full language track just as the Reading Mastery Program has a full, re, uh, full language track. How many of you use the Reading Mastery Program or support it in your schools? Okay. How many of you use Horizons? Good, that's a good number. Well, keep your eye out for this new one because it's also going to be tablet-based, you know, so for electronic delivery. His academic and popular writings are as numerous as the instructional programs he has produced. His latest contribution is a chapter in this book, hot off the press, The Science and Success of Engelman's Direct Instruction, which is available in the Nifty store and a 20% discount for Nifty members, of course. <laughs> in addition to writing programs and scholarly articles, Dr. Engelman has been a pioneer in the implementation of effective instructional methods. As many of you know, his school-wide model of implementing direct instruction 
as core instruction for all students has been tremendously positive in terms of improving student performance in schools across the US as well as abroad. On Wednesday at the reception that Brian mentioned, we're going to get to see some footage of the Engelman Breiter Preschool at the University of Illinois where DI started. And that footage hasn't been seen in something like 40 years. So I hope you will go and see that. Right now, though, he's going to talk with us about direct instruction and effective teaching. Please help me welcome Zig Engelman to the podium. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wow. I can't possibly follow that act. I mean, uh, uh, standing. Well, I'm impressed. Thank you very much. So today, the topic is going to be what DI can do for you. And we need a slide. Oh, there it is. Look at this. See, normally, it's close here, we can see what's happening, but it's, it's happening over there. It's remote, but it will happen. What DI can do for you? This is designed for the half that have not done DI, so the rest of you guys will just have to kind of like listen. And uh, it's not for you. Actually, it is for you, because hopefully it reflects some of your experiences and also it may be applicable to some of the things you want to say to people who are new and who are learning DI. And here's the first fact. The main challenge schools face is to accelerate lower performers. I mean, this is an endeavor, and they have never been successful at doing it. They have tried since the 1960s. They've done math, the new math, math your way, math our way, math up the scale, so to speak, and uh, all have failed. They've done the same with reading endeavors and acceleration, and they operate from a kind of crazy notion that the way to do it is to challenge students, make it more challenging, and the students will buck up and learn. Well, it doesn't happen that way, and they have about 60 years of data to show it doesn't happen that way, because nothing they have ever proposed works. And the same will hold true of the Common Core Standards. It will be a raging failure, and in the end, they'll change it. But understand the context of where we're at now. It is in this challenge to accelerate lower performers. Um, and DI has done this. DI can empower you with uh, information about how to teach kids that aren't being taught and to teach skills that most teachers can't teach. I mean, there are skills that are taught all the time, or ostensibly taught all the time, but uh, they're not really taught if you look at the performance of kids. Kids are being taught at, not taught. So um, this empowerment is very powerful. Like, it means something for you and something for the kids. But, uh, and it's something that doesn't happen overnight. DI can't transform you overnight into a superstar. As we'll see, it takes several years for that to happen, but there are several well-spent years, and even after the first year, you'll be way better at teaching than you've ever taught before, particularly if you look at the kids who aren't taught, the lower performers. The benefits, the benefits are for students, 
their parents, other teachers, the community and school, and possibly most of all, you. Um, benefits to the students. What are the benefits to the students? Oh, only humanity, that's all. You're providing kids who otherwise would have no option with a choice. When they get old enough to go to college, they'll have the choice of being able to say, do I want to go to college? Or maybe I want to go to a technical school or maybe just go into the job force now. But it will be a choice. They won't be preempted from making any of those choices because they never learned the skills. No, they have the skills and therefore they have power, the kind of power that only teaching can convey to them. It can't happen any other way. Goodwill, slogans, money, all this other stuff ain't going to do squat. The teacher is going to be the one who is responsible for transforming these low performers. So it, it's true. Um, and the ones who will also benefit from it are the parents. I mean, have you ever seen parents who have a kid in kindergarten who can read and they come in and they tell you, like the kid in kindergarten can read better than my third grader. And that happens a lot, that parents are knocked out when they discover indeed that their kids can be taught, their kids can learn, their kids can succeed in school. So it benefits the heck out of the parents. Other teachers, consider the school as a unit that is supposed to grind out successful kids. And if you're doing your job, you're setting it up for teachers in the later grades to do their job more effectively more effectively because the kids are coming in prepared. They can start at a higher level. They can accelerate them at a faster rate. They can do things better because you did your job well. And the community and the schools, well, what are they about? That's what they're supposed to be all about. Transforming failed kids or kids who would otherwise fail and have no place in the workforce or in the higher echelons of society's classification systems, a chance. Give them a chance, man. That's what it's supposed to be all about. So yes, the community, the school, and you, because you will have pride in knowing that you can do what very few others can do that you can take kids and say, in effect, it doesn't matter how bad the present and your status is in terms of you, where you are, what you don't know. We'll take you where you are, and we'll start there with the skills you have, and we'll transform you into something a heck of a lot better. And we'll do it systematically as a team, as an effort that will persist through the grades. Okay, now DI programs have a different form. They're different from other uh, traditional programs. And this is as true today as it was like 40 years ago. I mean, today they still have programs of this form where you have a lesson. You have a lesson in something. I mean, you know, what the hell is this, church or something? A lesson, and you remember it. Okay, no, the form of DI is that a lesson consists of five or more independent activities. Like in beginning reading, you have some where you do some sounds, you say some things out loud. What is that, phonological awareness or what? Listen, motor boat, say it fast. Motor boat, good job. And you have some other activities where you write some things and it's pretty modest 
And each day, you have five or more things in each lesson in each day, they become a little more complicated, a little more sophisticated. And you become a little more sophisticated, and the kids become a little more sophisticated. It's a heck of a sophistication operation. <laughs> Each skill is developed gradually from lesson to lesson. That's important. That's very important. So you got these independent things, so you're not just relying on teaching one big thing, you're teaching a bunch of little things in a systematic fashion. Okay, DI has a different function. Lessons are designed, oh boy, is this important. This is probably the key page right here. Lessons are designed to teach everything to mastery and to teach everything in less time. Whoa, if you put those two together, that is the formula for accelerating. Because what do you have to do to accelerate? Well, you have to teach kids things. Whoa, whoa, that implies mastery. They mastered it. You didn't just talk at them, they learned it, right? So they achieved mastery, and you did it in less time than it has occurred before. Well, boy, when you do those two things, you have changed those kids enormously. And th this function of DI is sort of unique because of the different process that we have. For DI, um, we don't just make it up and publish it. That's what's done with other programs. They make it up and publish it. Who makes it up? Copywriters, people off the street? You don't know. Uh, <laughs> Who publishes it? That you know, because they're all over your school and they're convincing you they have the best. Okay, all material, DI material, is field tested and revised on the basis of student performance before it's ever published. And the purpose of the field testing and revision is not to prove that it works, we don't care about that. We can't do anything to improve a program that works well. We want to find out where it doesn't work. We want to find out where we screwed up. We want to find out where our assumptions were incorrect, where the kids need more practice and the program needs revision. Because that's what we can change. That's what we can fix. And that's what we fix up before we publish that program. We make sure that it works with the kids it's supposed to work with, and it works with their teachers. Nothing, this is a sort of like a footnote, if you're just looking at DI programs, nothing, not the smallest, dinkiest thing, is assumed to be taught in less than three consecutive lessons. So it'll appear in some exercise, in, Three, how many? 15? Okay, 15 minutes. I have to speed up a little bit here. So I'm gonna talk a little faster, a little, a little louder. Here we go. Okay. Uh, I forgot what I was saying though. Okay, DI provides a model for teaching uh, other skills, any skill, and here it goes. Uh, you start with your small steps, small steps, not big lumps, small steps. Why small steps? Well, okay, we'll see. Let's go through this and then we'll come back. Um, that means simpler, better corrections. Why? Well, you're correcting only this much. So that's relatively easy compared to correcting this much. So if you have a, a big lump before you ask questions or find out what they learn, you have a big lump to correct if they ain't got it. But if you have a little one and you ask for a signal and it's, the pacing is good and all the details are in time and here we go, uh, it's cute, it's fun, it moves, and it keeps the kids' attention. So, you have small steps, 
leads to simpler, better corrections, and that leads to easier mastery. It's easier to achieve mastery because you're dealing with these smaller bits, and that leads to faster learning rate. That leads to faster learning rate. That leads to, oh, we haven't told how that works. We'll come back in a second. And that leads to smarter students. The faster learning rate. We've done a lot of work with teaching highly unfamiliar content to students. And highly unfamiliar means that it takes sometimes hundreds of trials for them to learn the first few set of simple examples. And yet, later on, they start learning if you teach them to mastery. That means they can really do it. They have really learned it. And you continue to do that, they will start to learn faster and faster and faster. And later, it won't take anywhere near that number of trials for them to learn a perfectly parallel example that they have never seen before. Like if it took them, well, like how much faster? Like in some of the studies we've done, the students have improved to a rate that's 14 times faster than their original rate. Imagine, 14, let's say it took 28 trials for them to get one correct, 28 trials, that later on they'd get it in two trials. Holy cow, and kids change. And we've actually done a couple of studies in which we showed that we divided kids up into high and low, let the high do what the highs do, and we did the lows, and our lows passed up the highs on very significant content, that they could do it better, they were smarter, they were faster, and if you looked at them, you could tell they were smart by their vocabulary, by their use of, of ideas, by their responses, because they've practiced that. That's what they've practiced every day for a long time. So, um, so if here's an implication of this model. You can boil it down to this. If simple corrections don't work, what does that tell you? The sequence is flawed. That's very important. So one way, if you want to test material you're using that's not DI, is give it the correction test. Can you give a simple correction on what you just taught? I mean, can you present simple examples? Present the examples on what you just taught. If the kids can't do it, that tells you that the system is probably flawed. So the keys of all this are the sequences are shaped by field testing, and here they come again, mastery and facts about faster learning. And those are the biggies. So here, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, like throwing rocks or other things at uh, the Common Core standards. I'd prefer other things. But uh, you don't want to go overboard with the Common Core because they're based on this old tradition of the way to improve kids is to challenge them, make it more difficult for them to learn, and they will learn more difficult concepts. It's never been demonstrated. It's never been uh, even given a, a, a sensible endorsement. But there's, so there's no wisdom in the common core standards or the evidence behind them. These were not created by teachers who had taught the material. This is, these are created by people who sat around a table and shared ideas, but they have never, obviously, taught kids successfully, or they would not entertain the, the standards that they have developed. I'll give a couple of examples uh, from reading and one from math, but understand 
there are many, many flawed standards in the Common Core. And that doesn't mean that you can't design a program to deal with it. That means you have to be very damn clever to do it, and you also have to be very careful that you are not compromising like the intellectual value of the program by messing around with these standards. K reading, here's a standard. Seems pretty straightforward. Ask and answer, kindergarten kids, ask and answer questions about unknown words in a text. Well, let me think. Kindergarten kids asking, uh, asking, well, if they don't know the unknown word in the text, seems reasonable to have them ask it and answer it. Hell, I don't know, I guess. We could figure out how to give them the answer, but uh, here's the big question about this item. I mean, think about that. How'd that unknown word get in that text? <laughs> These are kindergarten kids. Come on, we're going to give them a text with unknown words, words they can't figure out, sound out, or identify. What are we doing? What are we thinking of? Have we not selected our material so it's consistent with what they're being taught? Boo us. I mean, here's another example. I've truncated it some, but it's um, isolate and pronounce sounds in CVC words. You have to say CVC words in a big voice. I mean, this is from the 50s. This goes back all the way. CVC, consonant, vowel, consonant, like run, three sounds, er, consonant, uh, vowel, n, consonant, hit, set. <laughs> no, that, we don't use that one. No rhyming words here, please. Uh, uh, and it's, it's three sound, but it's not consonant, a single consonant. Okay, um, CVC word. Well, here's the rule about, um, about kids. Like, they generalize on the basis of what you teach them. So if you teach them something that's not properly generalizable, some of them will improperly generalize. Um, what's, what's improper about this? Well, if you spend all your time on CVC words, and the kids don't have contact with VC words, CV words, VVC words, and VCC, BB, or any of the others, how are they going to know they exist? I mean, all they know is that little window of what you're teaching them. So what happens when they encounter the first if, or the first two, or what, they are going to try to change it to a three-sound word. Watch it. I mean, if you want to do it experimentally, go in some classroom where they're teaching that stuff, and watch those low performers when they first have to deal with two sound words and four sound words, you'll see that they are totally screwed up because the instruction they received stipulated uh, something that's not true. So, um, CVC words, bite the big one. And, <laughs> no, I mean, Words, words, you teach words. That's what they're going to read, words. So what do you teach? Words. CVC, sure, and all the others. Okay, and K-math. Again, these are kindergarten kids. And this may seem sensible. Example, write numbers 1 through 20. Well, well that, that, that seems reasonable, right? Well, let's test it. What generalization would they learn about how to write numbers from the number name of uh, those numbers uh, through 20? Well, let's see. Let's go to the teens. Uh, 16, you say 16, you say 16, and you write the 6 as the second number. And then you write the teen, the 10, in front. Wow. 
Okay, so they learn that for uh, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. They do it again, and they do it again, and they do it again, and they do it all damn year long. And then the next year, they discover 57 and 63 and all those other numbers. Do they follow the same rule? No, they follow an opposite rule. When you say 63, what do you write first? The six. What do you write second? The three. So a bunch of kids will have reserve, I mean reversal problems because they were mistaught seriously in the first place. And so the, the, the motto is that any program has to be very cognizant, and teachers have to be cognizant, that kids generalize from what they are taught. And if they're taught something that is, uh, is an improper generalization, like working on numbers from 1 through 20, I couldn't think of anything stupider, really. No, in the long run, I, I can think of many as stupid, but uh, not a lot stupider. And, and, and think of what you do, though. But why wouldn't you do it sensibly? Why wouldn't you teach them to write the numbers that are most generalizable? The 72s and the 91s and all that. Man, and they get fluent at that. And then, then and only then, when they had those at Mastery, you could teach the... Uh, the teens, and you tell them that teens are goofy. Remember, if you hear teen, it's a goofy number, it's backwards. Okay, now they can deal with it. Now they have a basis for understanding it. Now they can classify it appropriately. So their, their skills will change a great deal according to what you teach. Five? Huh? 25. My time is up. No. <laughs> um, so actually, I'm on the last page. I read, oh, a second from the last page. Uh, I, I read this thing a whole bunch of times and tried to rehearse it. I didn't come close. Okay, how will your skills change? Well, I find three pages, so I'm not that close. Ed. But I'll, I'll go fast. I'll go fast. In, uh, how will your skills change when you do DI? In one year, you will improve a lot. You won't be a star, you'll still have some problems, and, but if you try doing it the right way, follow the script, try to use time carefully, and present to mastery, time and mastery, time and mastery. After three years, you will be a star, guaranteed and you'll be able to teach stuff that very few teachers can teach, particularly to lower performers. So DI provides a model that you can use for other things you teach. The test is pretty simple. Use the same kind of corrections you use for DI. If you can't bring the students to mastery, the program has design problems, fix it or dump it. And last, if you work at presenting, you learn to do it by the numbers, and after three years, you'll be a star, and you'll do things that make you proud, and that serve everybody who cares about kids. So it's damn worthwhile, and um, I'm really proud of the people I work with, because they have stuck with it, and uh, we ain't going to quit. <laughs> Thank you very much. Always inspirational. <laughs> Thank you, Zig. So I want to introduce our next keynote speaker. That's Laura Doherty. Um, Laura has served as president and CEO for the Baltimore Curriculum Project since uh, 2012, 
She's been a, interested in teaching since she was just this tall. Uh, in 1994, she began teaching and eventually consulting with the Chicago Public Schools in a large direct instruction implementation project. Later, serving as headmaster and teacher at the Baraka School, a boarding school in Kenya, Africa, for at-risk boys. She has led and managed all aspects of the direct instruction spelling implement or direct instruction implementation for reading, math, writing, spelling, and U.S. history. As president and CEO of the Baltimore Curriculum Project, she directs the work of three neighborhood co conversion charter schools as they use direct instruction to improve education for Baltimore City students through curriculum implementation, teacher training, in-class coaching, and data analysis. I'd also like to say on a personal note, she's got a fine family, great kids, a fantastic husband, and just please give us a warm welcome. Give Laura a very warm welcome. Thank you, Brian. Good morning, everyone. It is my profound pleasure and distinct honor to be here this morning to talk to you all about the work that my beloved colleagues and I have been doing in Baltimore for the last 18 years and to share a few other thoughts in our shared struggle to do the best we can with and for all of the kids entrusted into our collective care. I'm Laura Doherty, as Brian says, and I am the president of the Baltimore Curriculum Project for the last two years, but I've been working with our schools since 1999, uh, with NIFTY, in fact. So I know these schools well. Um, we are a not-for-profit organization that operates three, but soon to be four, yay, charters, conver conversion charter schools in Baltimore. Uh, conversion charter schools take existing traditional public schools that want to be operated by, say, the Baltimore Curriculum Project, and they receive charter status. They still continue to serve their neighborhood kids, and in the case of Baltimore City, those are mostly in very poor neighborhoods serving their neighborhood kids. Um, and looking around here, I see that we have wonderful, hardworking people from at least three of those schools here today. We have some teachers, we have some coaches, and we have some administrators. So if you are from Baltimore, let me hear a shout out. Come on now, my people. Come on. Yeah, put your hands in the air like you just don't care. All right. Well, it was a small but vocal group. Thank you. Okay. I am delighted to be the speaker at this, the 40th annual DI conference in good old wonderful Eugene, Oregon, because 40 years is a very big deal. Nothing in education lasts for 40 years except for these fantastic programs that people will not give up on because they work. So yeah, let's give Zig and everybody a big hand for lasting 40 years. I mean, because really, as far as many of you know, um, I may not even have been around 40 years ago. <laughs> what, Jerry, can I not sell that line? Hmm? All right, well, all right, I was around, but I, at that time I was most likely having some BD reversal issues because uh, back then they were almost certainly introduced to me essentially simultaneously, and we now know from Zig that that is a big no-no. But I do believe that by delivering this particular keynote, at first I thought it was the first husband-wife duo to do this, uh, but then I found out Eric and Ella Mahmoud did it, so second wife husband duo to do this, because 10 years ago, my husband Chris was the keynote speaker here when he was the director of the Reading First program at the U.S. Department of Education. And I know speaking here was a great honor for him then, as it is for me now. Um, what I now know even better than I did before, though, when I watched him, uh, was, how, was likely how nervous he was to be up here, particularly because he, like me, holds so many of you in such high regard. And it is humbling to be addressing this group of dedicated professionals. Okay. Okay. I'm okay now, thank you for that pause. Um, and speaking of the devil, I would like to take a moment to send you Chris's best. He has a lot of dear friends here today, and uh, some of you really may be interested in how he's doing, particularly because I know that Looking around, Chris owes a lot of you guys money. <laughs> but as many, of you, as many of you know, he ended up working in Washington for five years with Reading First, openly and unapologetically 
working to help put scientifically based reading instruction into the hand, including DI, of course, into the hands of students and teachers across the nation. He was and remains very proud of his work with Reading First. And contrary to widespread belief, he was not run out of town on a rail. I know for a fact he drove home on his last day. <laughs> All right, so we established that there are a lot of returning people here, but uh, newbies, let me give a, please give a wave and holler if you're a first time person here at this conference. Okay. All right, yay, all right, there's a lot of you. And that's great because first time attendees, listen up. Tradition has it that you guys pay for all the drinks and snacks of the veteran attendees here. No questions asked, and tradition is very important here in Eugene. All right, one more thing I want to, to tell the new folks is that a lot of us, myself included, look forward to this conference every year. We feel like pretty much everyone here is a kindred spirit. I have felt this way since the first time I attended this conference, and I feel it viscerally and electrically every time I am here. And we are kindred spirits and like-minded in a way that says we are here because we want to do the very best we can with the kids and schools under our care. This can be on a small group intervention level, maybe it's the special ed resource room level, or the whole school level, possibly the three, soon to be four, conver conversion charter school level, or sometimes, if you're lucky, at a district or state level where it's really supported. But this shared mission and passion is what makes me feel a strong and positive bond with everyone, old friend and brand new person alike, that I see at this conference. And for better or worse, it makes me act and feel much more unguarded and open. But don't mistake this for an attempt at some big group hug, because I did not audition for Up With People as a child, and I am not one of those motivational speakers now. When I see old DI friends, or new DI friends, who, like so many of us, are in the educational trenches, experiencing both the very high highs and the very low lows of this work, my first instinct is not to go for a hug. It's to go for a drink. Because let's face it, this is hard work, sometimes punishing work. And I don't mean to put off any teetotalers here. I was, I was born and raised in Idaho, and there are lots of non-drinkers, most of my family included. So for those of you who don't drink alcohol, I am equally prepared to eat large portions of unhealthy food with you as we compare notes and battle scars. If that's what it takes, I can do that. Because this is really, really hard work. How's that for a motivational battle cry? You won't see that on a bumper sticker. But if you do this work, and you do it well, and you stick with it through lots of different challenges, your schools will experience incredible, joyful success. Over the last nearly two decades, BCP has developed and maintained a handful of the very best schools in Baltimore City. For example, we're going to start with Hampstead Hill. Uh, Baltimore City has 30-something charter schools, and most of them have had to undergo renewal in the last couple of years where they reapply for their, for their contracts. And uh, I'm going to start by showing you how Hampstead Hill did. These were, this was the form that was sent to the school board with the recommendations. The city created a very rigorous rubric, and in fact, non-renewed a lot of schools who didn't meet their standards. But uh, Hampstead Hill is a, a pre-K through eight school with 714 kids. And the first category they looked at is, is the school an academic success? This was the doozy of a category, you know, because we can argue about what they you know, used as a determinant of success, but it was worth half of the rubric, and Hampstead Hill scored highly effective in that category. The second category was, does the school have a strong school climate? Again, Hampstead Hill was rated highly effective there. The last criteria was, has the school followed sufficient financial management and governance practices? And we had, so they were highly effective there. So you won't be surprised to see that they got a five-year renewal, which is the most they could give us. And in fact, it was the only school in all of the schools that were reviewed to be rated highly effective in all three categories. So that was, we were very, very proud of that. <laughs> the next school I'm going to talk about is Wolf Street Academy. Wolf Street Academy is a much smaller school. It has 205 students. Uh, three quarters of them come from Spanish-speaking homes. 
It is a Title I reward school, which means that this year they received a, a distinction of um, a Title I highest performing school, which means that they've uh, met all of their objectives for all of their subgroups for two consecutive years, and uh, based on our state test, they're closing the achievement gap. A handful of schools in this, around the city and the state got that award, and Wolf Street was one of them. It's considered an 80-80-80 school, which means that at least 80% of the students are minority students, at least 80% of the students qualify for free or reduced lunch, and at, at Wolf Street it's more like 95, and at least 80% of the students score proficient or advanced on the state test. Uh, they are up for renewal next year, and we fully expect them to also be rated highly effective in all three categories and get a five-year renewal. All right. And our last school is our beloved City Springs. The principal from City Springs is here. Where are you, Rhonda? Oh, there she is. But in case you can't see her, she's there on the bulldozer. And those of you who know Rhonda will not be surprised to find out she is, in fact, driving a bulldozer. So uh, uh, City Springs, let's find out a little bit about City Springs. Uh, there's 678 students at City Springs. It's a big school. And this... I thought it was worth differentiating free lunch from reduced lunch. 97% of the kids qualify for free lunch at City Springs and 2% for reduced lunch, which has to make it the highest poverty school in Baltimore City, I would say. And um, as some of you know, it used to be known as the worst school in Baltimore. There is a documentary done in the mid-90s, The Battle of City Springs, which was shown on PBS and now you can find on the Nifty website, um, just attesting to the fact that it was a really awful place for um, kids and adults alike. But it went from being that awful school to being an absolute magnet that attracts visitors from all around the country and all around the world. People, most people come to look at the direct instruction implementation, implementation. A lot of people come to look at the restorative practices implementation. But visitor after visitor walk away saying, this is a good school. This is a really good school. I'm in a lot of schools, and this is a really good school. It has been renewed twice by the city of Baltimore, which is no small feat, especially when you think about um, Dr. Muriel Berkeley, who founded BCP. When she started working with City Springs in the 90s, uh, a lot of people from the educational establishment said, why would you work with City Springs? Nothing works there. Because there had been several failed attempts at school-wide reform with organizations that we will, will remain nameless. Uh, but you know, people were saying nothing works there. Uh, well, DI did work there. And DI worked there because we had the combination of incredible tools and support from you know, just incredible support from the existing DI world. We worked very closely with NIFTY and still do, but we also had support from ERI, JP, and a host of other independent consultants, all of who poured into Baltimore to help us establish really solid and long-lasting DI implementations. So um, I'm gonna put that up there because uh, these are two girls who learned very successfully to read with direct instruction, and I thought you might also like to look at them as opposed to words on a page. So I'm gonna leave that up there for a few minutes. And I am gonna show you some data today from the schools I work with, and we're very proud of this data. But the data that drives the schools is kid-level data. As Zig was referring to, the nuts and bolts, what did this specific kid say or do when this specific teacher said or did this? What were the problems on this mastery test? Did just one kid have problems or did lots of kids have problems? Because that's all very important information on what you do next. And we have, we have data, rivers of data, coming from teachers, coming from coaches, and coming from those LPCs. Raise your hand if you're familiar with the, the lesson progress chart. All right, a lot of you are familiar with that. Uh, the teachers turn them in every week and they contain mountains of data that we all sit around. And I, I suspect, Gary, that LPCs may be responsible for some really, uh, for your retirement. Because I think, you know, I mean, I, I get that you're 70 or something, but I think it was looking at a stack of LPCs one more time and saying, I'm out. You know, because it, it is, it's time consuming, but it is the lifeblood of a good DI implementation. And we take all that data and we deploy our coaches. And when you have, a problem solution support cycle that you do week after week with your curriculum based data, it leads to both effective instruction and really healthy school climates. On the other hand, the data that I will show you is summative data, external test data. It's usually pretty high stakes and a great deal rides on these results. 
Yeah, it does remind me of that scene in a it's a wonderful life, you know, uh, when George jumps in and saves Clarence from the icy river, and they go to a bar afterwards, and I think George feels like Clarence ought to pay, because he did just save his life, so he says, um, you got any money? And Clarence says, oh no, we don't, we don't use money in heaven. And uh, George's reply was, well, it comes in pretty handy down here, bub. So when I think about test data and I get stressed out about it like George Bailey was about money, I can imagine myself asking Clarence, you know, so what's your standardized test data like in heaven? And he would reply, oh no, we don't use that kind of data in heaven. And my reply would be, well, it comes in pretty handy down here, bub. So uh, I guess we can stop worrying about test data and money if and when we get to heaven but probably not any sooner than that. So let me show you what we have. I'm showing you the MSA scores from 2004 on. And the MSA came in in 2003, but they didn't test very many grades, so I started in four. And we had already been working with our schools for many years, so that's not the worst, you know, that's not horrible, it's not great, but it's not horrible. That was the first year of the test, and then it went to there, and then to there. Year after year, we see something pretty exciting happening year after year. So. Now we have about you know, 10 years of making and maintaining um, school-wide and grade-wide um, Im improvement and sustaining it. And it is really, really hard to do that in the face of ever-changing demands from the state, ever-changing le leadership at the district level. Every single person who comes in wants to do their thing and wants to make their mark and put in their program that they know works. And it's, the, the teachers and the principals face incredible pressure to, to do something different to meet the latest demands of the day. So the fact that you know, Zig's been around 40 years doing this and we've been, you know, been around 18 years doing this, it, it, it's, it's, it's difficult for a lot of the wrong reasons. Um, it's difficult for some good reasons, like you know, we, we teach kids who are vulnerable and need really good teachers, and that's the good kind of hard. But uh, you know, we, we feel like in the, in the light of all those challenges, when you have this kind of success for this, you know, this amount of time, you really should get a ticker tape parade thrown for you. But you know, we realize that we're probably going to have to do it for ourselves if, if it happens. I would like to take a little closer look at that ticker tape parade, though, because um, my husband helped me with this slides. And you won't be surprised to know that as a good Irish Catholic boy from Boston, he has vowed to somehow work in JFK to every keynote he touches. <laughs> All right, so particularly for you younger teachers out there and for people who are new to DI, take it from those of us who are not quite, well, as blonde maybe as we want you to think we are, and, but if you can hang in there and don't give up and implement the programs with fidelity and do all of those other things which go into creating a rich and robust school, you will be successful, wildly, wonderfully successful in ways that have a real world choke you up, life improving, kid and family happiness increasing way. And it's that kid and family happiness which leads me to perhaps the greatest testament to our worth with our school system. And that is that all three of our schools have had truly staggering increases in, neighbor, in enrollment since they became BCP schools. Let's see what it looks like. Oops. That was, I'm just going to skip right through that one. That was about happy kids. But we're going to talk about enrollment in BCP schools. And you can see since we became, since we started operating the schools, enrollment has increased tremendously. And these are neighborhood schools. The neighborhoods haven't changed. How parents feel about their neighborhood school has changed. They really like not having to go to private schools or move to the county or, you know, fib about their address so they can get them into the school, you know, down the road. Um, and in fact, it was... You know, this, we are the largest charter operator in Baltimore. And because I, I, I think this data, uh, we were given a recent vote of confidence as we were awarded a fourth school, uh, Govins Elementary, which was already a, considered a high performing school. Now, I bet you know that school districts in general like to give up control and power of their high performing schools about as much as the Chinese Communist Party typically does. Um, but, you know, when you've demonstrated high achievement and incredible enrollment increases at your existing schools, they, they said it was in their best interest to do it. And so they awarded us, you know, we get to start operating Govins in a year. And I want to tell you a little bit about our experience with Govins. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it was already considered a high performing school. 
when the current principal, Linda Taylor, who is sitting there today, but I don't have a funny picture of Linda, so you know, nothing to put up, but when Linda took over the school, it was at risk of being taken over by the state because of low test scores. But under her very capable leadership, a leadership, by the way, developed as an officer within the finest fighting force this planet has ever known, the United States Army, uh, Govan's Elementary flourished. Test scores went up and stayed up. So Miss Taylor was golden. You know, no need to change a thing, right? Well, not if you're Linda Taylor. After learning about BCP from our founder and current Govan's volunteer, Muriel Berkeley, she decided that she wanted for her school what BCP had to offer. She already knew DI was effective because she'd been the assistant principal at the highest performing school in Baltimore City, which just happened to use DI. So what did she do? She endeavored to do what is among the hardest and least appreciated things to do in education and in life, to go from good to great. And so thus ensued a courtship with her staff, her school community, and the community at large. Because to apply to convert a, tr a traditional public school to a conversion charter, the staff has to vote for it. They have to really want it. And you also have to convince uh, the, the school board that the community uh, really supports this change. So we attended loads of community meetings where we talked about our model, and we took carload after carload of teachers, potential parents, and community members to our three existing schools for tours of what a BCP DI school looks like with a mature implementation. And we had a fair amount of resistance in the beginning and, um, and stemming largely from what people's perceptions were about direct instruction. They didn't know about it, but they're pretty sure what their, um, you know, what they'd heard wasn't good. So, uh, but what they did see at our schools left them wanting more. Because after visiting our schools, 90% of the staff voted in favor of the application. And the application itself had, to quote a school board member, a level of support from the community, the likes of which she had never seen. So the hard work of the teachers in the schools had, and this, these magnificent tools that we had had created learning communities that people want more of. So uh, um, I'm gonna, in the interest of time, I'm flipping ahead here for a second. But, um, there's, there is one particular DI of critique, or d critique of DI rather, that galls me a little bit, um, and it's that we think of DI as a silver bullet or a magic pill, that we think it's going to work just by implementing it. Um, we think precisely the opposite. Years of focusing on data and details and more data and more details every single day and constantly improving what you do with kids is the ever loving opposite of a magic pill. And um, remember how I said when I was so comfortable, I feel comfortable here among kindred spirits? Um, well, if I haven't shown that yet, I'm gonna share a little more. Um, I recently rejoined Weight Watchers, because I had joined years ago and hit my goal, and I was quite pleased with myself. I was doing just fine, and I thought, okay, I got this, I got this, I, can, I know what I'm doing, I don't need to follow a program. So I got off the program and absolutely, inexplicably, I put that weight back on. I know, right? It's shocking. Um, so I rejoined Weight Watchers and I'm, you know, I'm back with the program. And I don't work for them, I don't have stock in them, but it works. And very broadly, it's like the DI of the weight loss world. And it's because they know their stuff, they have spent years working out really logical, scientifically based, effective systems that work with real people. And if you follow the program and you, with fidelity and you stick with it, you will succeed. It's hard and you've got to stick with it, but it will work pretty much like they say it will. And once you have succeeded, it will get a little easier because you have to stick with the program. Uh, but, but you have to stick with the program. And Weight Watchers has a new tagline that I think really work, works for direct instruction. It's Weight Watchers because it works. So, how about direct instruction, because it works. And maybe, McGraw-Hill, maybe you could take that back to your genius marketing people. And, you know, we could be on to, because everybody knew what I was talking about when I said Weight Watchers, didn't you? All right. So, there is no magic pill for weight loss, and there is no magic pill for miraculous improvements. I mean, if there were a magic pill for weight loss, the first thing I would do would be to take one. Um, the second thing I would do would be to make sure my husband swallowed one, too. All right. 
All right. Um, and the, there's another thing that you're going to hear a lot of DI people say about DI, and that it works for all kids. And I say this too. And um, by all kids, I mean my kids. We send our kids to a DI school 30 minutes away from our house because it works and we want that for our children. So uh, when, when people are surprised and ask me about that, I say, well, you know, we want that for our kids. Wouldn't, wouldn't you want that for your kids? Um, now, I'm, I know you guys are trying to get out of here, so I'm going to finish up. So to recap, implementing good, sustained DI programs is hard, hard stuff. It's nothing good for a bumper sticker, and after 21 years into this, I'm, I'm, um, I'm thinking that it's harder than any reasonable person could have expected it to be to implement and sustain the most effective instructional tools to come down the pike ever. It's not a silver bullet or a magic pill, no matter how much we might want one, but rather lots and lots of hard work punctuated by wonderful successes and then periods of self-doubt when things don't go well. But all the while, you're surrounded by really wonderful, like-minded people who are working just as hard as you are and who you really don't want to disappoint. So you, you think of every, the difference you know you're making, of the kids who used to hate school and who now sit at the edge of their seat, poised and ready to answer because they know they're going to get it. And the praise for these kids is not vague and empty and well-meaning. It's specific and true and well-placed. And when I'm talking about these kids, I'm talking about these kids, and these kids, and these kids. And you know deep in your exhausted bones that you've earned those free drinks from the first time conference attendees, or those curly fries, and you are making a real difference for kids, and that's good. It's really, really good. Thank you all very much. Thank you for that, Laura. Thank you very much. So um, just a couple of little minor side notes. Uh, for those of you who are big on Twitter and whatnot, uh, we do have our own hashtag, which is uh, EugeneDI14, so you can follow us and see all the wonderful updates. In fact, there's already a little segment on Facebook of Zig's uh, opening. So just, you know, not during session, during your breaks. <laughs> During your breaks, check out some of those things, some uh, fun pictures and things like that of what are going on and the hard work that's going on also. There is a, a slight typo uh, that, would, uh, that I need to call it to, to people's attention on the schedule for today. It notes that uh, the session, the A session is running, the A and B sessions are running from 10 to 11.15. That is incorrect. They are running until 11.45. That's when you get your lunches at 11.45 to 1 o'clock. Other than that, the schedule looks pretty solid and pretty full to me. So I'll let you go see you in the hallways and definitely see you at the picnic at Skinner's Butte this evening. Uh, it, uh, food starts serving at 5.30 and we'll see you there, but also in your sessions. Take care. Have a good week.